second day of the workshop, which will be uh, entirely devoted actually to reinforcement learning from many different uh, perspectives. Um, I'd also like to remind you that um, at the end of the day, we're going to have a panel, uh, a lot of great panelists, not specifically about reinforcement learning, but about the themes of the workshop in general. Uh, and there's a link here on the whiteboard um, if you want to either submit uh, questions to the panel or vote on which uh, questions um, you'd like to hear uh, answers to. Um, okay, so now we're going to begin with the first talk of the day by Nan Jiang on hardness of reinforcement learning with fairly function approximation. Okay, um, this is okay so um, uh, it's my great pleasure to be here. And it's not on. It's not on. This. Uh, yeah. Okay. Great. Thanks. So, uh, yeah. So it's my great pleasure to be here, and uh, I'm Nan Jiang from uh, UIUC, and today I'll be talking about uh, some of my recent work and um, on value function approximation in RL. Um, okay. So. Uh, you know, as all of us know, RL is a machine learning par paradigm for uh, sequential decision making, and it finds many uh, potential applications in a wide variety of uh, scenarios, including like robotic side of systems, resource allocation, and so on and so forth. And in recent years, we've seen uh, inspiring success empirically of the application of RL in uh, game playing domains. So today, I'll be talking about a particular sub. Uh, a sub-area of RL known as value function approximation. And um, so this is, uh, the theme of this workshop is emerging challenges in uh, deep learning and I guess machine learning in general. And so today, what I want to revisit is some of the simplest, the most fundamental setting of reinforcement learning and uh, revisit some of the uh, theory that has been around for uh, a long time and um, it turns out that there are still many uh, widely open uh, problems that need to be uh, resolved. Okay. So what's value function approximation? So, so roughly speaking, so this is the setting where you use a restricted class of functions to approximate what we call the optimal value function, uh, Q star uh, of a uh, dynamical environment. I'll define these terms more formally later. Okay. And we're going to consider the batch mode learning. Again, uh, like a more formal uh, description will follow. So in the batch learning setting, so you know, in RL, you interact with the environment, right? Uh, but in the batch uh, mode learning setting, you get some data passively from, that's are generated from the environment, and you're supposed to learn a good policy just from the data you're given, and you have no further interactive access to the environment. Okay, so, so why do you care about the batch mode uh, VFA? Well, it turns out that uh, batch mode uh, VFA um, is kind of like the theoretical backbone for many popular deep RL algorithms today, for example, DQN. Right. So although those algorithms, they do have access to the environment and can actively explore, what you usually do is that you hook up a batch learning algorithm with a simple heuristic exploration kind of like a mechanism like Epsilon Greedy, which we know are inefficient in the worst case. So you really, would you really, so those methods, they really succeed because these methods, um, because somehow like the environment is easy to explore, so you get good data, and the batch learning component actually succeed when you have exploratory data. Okay, so you, you really need to understand why batch learning succeeds to, to understand why those algorithms actually work in practice. Okay. And in this talk, I'll be focusing on a single question uh, that is under what assumptions, and in particular, I, I would like to have the minimal set of assumptions that uh, so that we can guarantee sample efficient learning. Okay. So I'll be purely uh, be considering sample efficiency. <clears throat> okay. So so to give you a more concrete sense of what I mean or what kind of results that I'm looking for, I'm drawing a comparison to the most basic and fundamental result in statistical learning theory. Right. So this is something like statistical learning theory 101 that you were teaching in the day one class of like a, a learning theory class. Right. So so. So in supervised learning, let's consider the simple setting where we have ID uh, input output pairs that are drawn from a distribution. Right? 
And the simplest setting is where like you have a class of predictors f that predicts y from x. Here x and y can be uh, binary labels or like real value, uh, uh, or real value, it doesn't matter. Right. So uh, let's for now assume that f is finite, and one of them makes good predictions. Right. So the, the most, the simplest result that lays the foundation for the entire mention of learning theory, or at least one of the, those fundamental results is the following. Right? It says that uh, if you give me log f number of samples, I can find a good predictor out of this class. Right. Um, and this is the information theory, theoretical results because we're ignoring um, computation for now. And you can get this just by simply like empirical risk minimization. Right. So this is the, this is the simplest result um, for supervised learning. And what I really want is that I want an analogy of this kind of result for the RL setting. Right. So it's like simple basic assumptions and then a, a clean result. Okay, so let's first anticipate a little bit of what that result could look like. Right? So recall that we're thinking about batch mode value function approximation. Okay, so batch mode, we're going to have some data. Instead of like input-output pairs, in RL, the data will look like something like state action reward next day tuple, tuples. Um, and I'll define how they're generated in a second. And there's one further assumption that, uh, that need to be made is that this data set needs to be exploratory. And I will formally define what that means in a second. Okay. And similarly, we're going to have a class of candidate value functions, f. Again, we're going to assume that this is finite. And one of them is the q star, the optimal value function that we want to capture or want to approximate. Okay. So this is all very basic. So the central question we want to answer is, under these, these seem like pretty minimal assumptions uh, for this setup. I want to understand if these assumptions are sufficient for guaranteeing um, uh, sample efficient learning. And here by sample efficient, I mean that I only want to pay logarithmic in f uh, number of samples. And I'm, I'm, I'm omitting another, uh, a few other parameters here, uh, which I'll define later, for example, the horizon of the problem is uh, also needs to appear here. But roughly speaking, that's the, it's the, uh, this is the high-level picture that I want to get at at the end. Okay. So, um, so it turns out, so you can, uh, and, and in particular, the, the key assumption here is that we're, we're assuming what we call uh, realizability, right? We have a function class that captures the function, the target function that we want to approximate. Okay, so the, the key question is, are these assumptions sufficient? Okay, so, um, and people have st been studying this setting for, I don't know, more than 20 or 30 years. And as far as I know, the answer to this question is that we don't know. Okay, so um, I think there, so this is what I'd be talking about in the rest of this talk. I think we have uh, pretty reasonable evidence to believe that these assumptions are in insufficient. In particularly, for the representation condition, you need something that is much stronger than realizability. But we don't really have a um, counterexample or an uh, algorithm agnostic lower bound against like, uh, the current setup. And uh, uh, sorry, uh, let me, yeah, go ahead. How is it related to like, the sequence of work of uh, Johan Zinger of uh, sort of learning to maximize submodular functions? And basically, what is like, the end result is that you, you, there are function classes that modular for simple ones for which you can know how to learn, you know how to maximize, but from sample you, you are not going to you're going to do very badly. Is this in the same spirit what you're trying to do here? I I'm not familiar with that uh, body of literature. I'm not sure. So um, why not I go more deeper into this and maybe you can bring it up later if you find it more uh, relevant. Okay, so, uh, so uh, to get deeper into uh, this uh, question, uh, I want to formally define all these like vague notions and notations over here so that we have a, a more formal mathematical setup um, to, uh, to discuss these things. Okay. So we're gonna, as usual, we're gonna consider markup decision processes. Uh, think of this as a multi-step uh, decision procedure where for, we're going to have each uh, episode, and within each episode, there are time steps. So, uh, so you start observing some state S1, 
from a state space uh, big S. And for now, we're, because we're thinking of uh, function approximation, uh, the, state space, the state space is assumed to be very large in the sense that you cannot pay um, any dependence on the size of the state space that's like tabular RL. Okay? And after observing the current state, the learner will choose an action AH uh, from the action space. And you get some Im inter, uh, immediate reward uh, as a function of the current state and the current action. So it's a, there's a reward function. And then you transition stochastically to the next state, uh, SH, uh, sorry, for, uh, SH plus 1 for, uh, based on SH and AH. And that's defined by the transition dynamics. And you keep doing this for a number of time steps. It can be a finite or infinite with this kind of um, oscillator. OK. So uh, the ultimately, what you want is to find a policy pi that maps states to actions. And the measure of goodness of a policy is defined as the scalar, uh, which is the discounted sum of rewards in expectation. When you follow this policy, you take actions using this policy, and you start from some given initial state distribution mu zero. And here, this gamma is a discount factor that kind of like translates of like how long this uh, the decision making is, or how many time steps do you need to uh, make decisions to finish an episode? So within this talk, I will be like switching back and forth, or use the finite horizon undiscounted case uh, MDP and the infinite horizon discounted case kind of like interchangeably because they're not really like that much different from each other. Um, so um, if you want to think it conveniently, think of it as like a each step uh, decision process. You make each step, you make each decisions, and the episode ends, and you restart from the initial state distribution. And yeah, so uh, new zero is the initial state distribution. Uh, for example, if you're playing the game, like say you play the game of Go, then apparently the initial state is like the empty board. And here we're we're thinking of like episodic tasks where the initial state is well defined. Okay, just uh, as a uh, kind of like a visual example, think of like as a game playing, and here we'll be getting state that are like say pixel images, although this is not strictly Markovian state, but very for now. And your action will be control signals that you send to the game. And Im intermediate immediate rewards will be the game points that you get off for the current time step. And then you transition to the next state, which is the next game screen. And this transition can be stochastic because, for example, some of the random uh, game mechanisms. And you want to learn a policy that tells you what uh, button to put uh, to press, given the current game screen. Okay. So, and we're doing because we're going to do value function approximation. So it's uh, very important to um, introduce some of the key solution concepts. Right. So the key solution concept, the optimal Q value function that I just uh, mentioned previously, is this function over here. And it says that. Starting from a state and action, if you start from this state S, and you take the first action uh, as A, and after that, you behave optimally. We're maximizing over all possible ways of behaving uh, for the remaining actions, A2 all the way to A infinity. What's the expected value that you can get? Right, so this is, the, this is a very central concept to reinforcement learning uh, for two reasons. The first reason is that if you, if you obtain this value function, you will in, in, uh, immediately get the optimal policy because you can just simply behave greedily according to this Q star. Or at a, any state S, you take the action that maximizes Q star of SA. And that's the optimal policy. Okay, so this is it's like if you get this function, you're done. And furthermore, this function is in some sense kind of like easier to find. In the sense that it satisfies uh, what we call the Bellman equation. Okay. So this is the famous uh, principle of optimality that says that the optimal value you get uh, in the current state is equal to the immediate reward plus the optimal discounted future value for the next time step in expectation. Right. So here, this is the immediate reward. And here, we're taking expectation over future optimal values over the transition probability from the current state and action. And the, you, you realize that this is a, like a, 
uh, fixed point equation. Q star appears on both ends, uh, both sides of the equation, and it's nonlinear because there's a, a max operator. Okay. So uh, the the existence of this Bellman equation uh, is kind of like crucial to uh, a particular like our policy learning from just the like single step transition tools. Okay. So this is the basic RL setup. Uh, we're yeah. Go ahead. So this question, I think Yusha asked about connection to submodular. So did you ask because of the Since maps? I wanted like these relationships sort of at a high level, it's sort of ring the bell. So they both have a max, but I think because of the state and the policy, it's quite different. I think the connection was that submodular <coughs> maximization and the Bellman <coughs> equation as a max. So it's so it's a, a submodular maximization is much easier because you're looking for a point. Right. Okay, so this is the kind of like an MDP setup, and now we're going to the uh, learning setting, right? So we're, we're learning the policy from samples. So I have to tell you like how do I generate the data, uh, and uh, uh, how do I approximate the target function and so on and so forth. So our data set is the, uh, a, a bag of tuples, uh, of state action reward next state uh, tuples. And for simplicity, I will assume that kind of like the IID setting of RL, where the SA pairs are drawn from ID from a fixed distribution, mu, which I'll call the data distribution. And we'll have needed some assumptions on this distribution. Basically, we need this distribution to like, fully cover the entire state action space. Uh, but we'll come to, to that later. <coughs> and every time, once you draw state action, uh, you generate the reward and random next state according to the MDP dynamics. Okay, so this is our data. And um, for learning, we're going to have a, a function class f that captures q star. This is realizability. And we're going to assume that f is finite, and we, we want to only pay logarithmic dependence on the cardinality of f. Okay, so the final goal is that we want to learn a function f that is approximately, uh, that is approximate q star, such that its greedy policy is near optimal. Right. Um, and recall that by near optimality, I mean that if you evaluate the policy that you find uh, with this evaluation metric, it is absolutely close to the best that you can get. Right. We're always talking about the scalar expected return under the given initial state distribution. Yes, go ahead. So epsilon close for each state? No, for just for the single under the epsilon close under the initial state distribution. Not, not for every single state. OK, so the value function for each state should be epsilon close to the optimal value function. No, no, no. no. That's, uh, so it's, or think about this way. So it's without loss of generality, you can think of this, this episodic problem uh, starting from a single initial state. Let's say the in-game of Go is the empty board. All I want is that my policy is epsilon close to the optimal policy when evaluated in the initial state. That is, you play the game under the, uh, starting from the empty board, I get as high winning rate as the like, optimal policy. Okay. And basically, that's the, the, the reason is that you don't expect to get like, global, like uniform epsilon approximation because the state space is very large. And if you want that kind of results, you usually, uh, you can only get those kind of results in the tabular setting. It's, We'll see some of the reasons why you can't get it uh, in a function approximation setting. Okay. So this is the learn. Yeah. Go ahead. But also, you, you don't want to get it. This, this, if you make this. What? Your goal, depending on your, depending on your scenario. But I would argue that this is a reasonable scenario, right? This is like, let's say you're doing dialogue systems. Well, you want to satisfy the customer when they come, like fresh, starting from a new session. You don't, you don't really care about if like someone else is doing a session and in the middle they hand the session. That just doesn't matter. Okay, so uh, again, this is just uh, some visual illustration, which I'll go over quickly. So, so basically, if you think about this, like this whole learning uh, problem in like video game playing, right? So you think of like the, this video game as a, like a huge MDP, it's like a huge like stochastic graph, uh, controlled stochastic graph, and for each uh, and each screen will be a node in this in this graph, and they are interconnected with each other. And essentially what you're doing when you do value function approximation is that you extract some features from these game screens and write on a parametric function, for example, using a deep neural net or uh, whatever function approximator you use, 
and you hope to find the parameter theta such that the function represented by uh, the, uh, the parameter theta is a good approximation of Q star. And roughly what you're doing is that you're trying to find this f theta uh, by, um, by finding the theta such that f theta approximately satisfy the Bellman equation induced from the data. Okay, so I'll go into details of uh, that procedure in a second. Okay, so this is our learning goal. And now I can like re kind of like ask the same question that I asked from the beginning again in a slightly more formal manner. There's still some missing pieces. But more formally, so basically we say, can we, um, we, uh, we, we want to know if it is possible to learn a good app that induces a good uh, greedy policy with a sample size or a sample complexity that is polynomial in a number of things. I want to wrap some one over the other, their standard pack parameters, uh, and a horizon of the problem, and logarithmic dependence on the size of the function class. And basically, that's it, right? Um, and as I said, like people have been studying this for like long, long time. So we do have some uh, positive results and have some very good, uh, fairly good understanding of this problem. So from what we know in the literature, the answer is yes, we can achieve the sample complexity, but only under two additional assumptions. And what I'll be focusing on the rest of the talk are exactly like what those assumptions are and what are the implications. Okay, so you need two assumptions here. The first assumption is on data. Like basically you need data to be exploratory. And, I'll, and exploratory in the sense that it turns out that you need something like no policy will induce the distribution that is too different from the data distribution mu. And I'll define that uh, shortly. And the other assumption, and, and we will see that this, this assumption is like actually necessary in some sense. Um, in, in, uh, in the sense that if you remove this assumption altogether, you can, you can prove uh, exponential lower bound uh, against the, this setting. So learning is inefficient in the worst case. But the more interesting and more kind of like mis uh, mysterious assumption is the second one that says that my function class does not, like even if I have a realizable function class, that's not enough. I need something that's much stronger. And one typical assumption people make is to say that this F function class is closed under a particular operator called the Bellman update operator. Okay, so if I have these two assumptions, I can prove this polynomial sample complexity. But it turns out that we still don't know, like, why we, re like, is it that we really need this assumption over here, or can we remove it altogether? And by studying that, uh, it, it turns out that uh, investigation into these issues review some uh, very interesting applications, and uh, I'll be talking about that. So, so with these assumptions, uh, what are the best, I mean, are there lower bounds known for on, on each of these parameters? I, I guess it's like with these assumptions, these are things, at least like poly in these parameters are the best you can hope for. Right. So, so there are lower bounds that would uh, So lower bounds. I mean, so, so first of all, like RL is like strictly more difficult than like supervised learning. So you can't get better than log F. Right, sure. No, so, with, um, but there's a, there should be a horizon dependence, but I'll be talking about that in a minute as well. What is the mu here? Is mu the... Mu is the data distribution. Oh, I'm assuming for simplicity that we get these tuple data, is where that, SA is, uh, AD, is ID from mu. Is that coming from optimal policy or...? No, it's a, it's a exploratory uh, uh, distribution. Uh, we're, like we, we, we would need to define this, which I'll get into here. Right? And, and the learner knows mu. The learner, so the learner may or may not know mu. I, uh, I think most algorithms are agnostic to the knowledge of mu, but really it doesn't really matter here. Yeah. Okay, so the first assumption is on, uh, on the data. Okay, so here is, this, uh, is the assumption. How do we, yeah? A quick question, so, um, so you were saying that the data assumption is, is necessary, that things are pretty close to mu, but uh, that's only in this batch RL setting. Yes. Clear that there are easy cases where a little bit of exploration can can get a much better bound. So I see you're saying that. So I, I think that's that's an open problem. Uh, I think I'm still thinking about it. It's like like if you have batch data and you give my you give yourself a little bit of extra exploration, can you do like much better than I don't know. But that would be one of the cool things that if you did have a concrete yeah. lower bound, then you could beat it with you yes. Can use the yes. 
And, and we'll be like actually contrasting the batch setting to the exploration setting uh, in this talk as well. Okay. So this is the um, so the first assumption says the following. Okay. So mu is our data distribution. So this is just the illustration of a distribution over state action pairs. And what you consider is that you consider any policy pi that you want to consider. For example, the greedy policy of your candidate value functions, and you compare these two distributions. And in particular, you take any state action and you compute the ratio between the densities of these two distributions. <coughs> so what you say is that, okay, let C be a uniform upper bound on this density ratio. And now I want to make the assumption that C is small, or like say C is constant, or in other words, I'm happy to pay, say, polynomial dependence on the C parameter. So basically what I'm saying is that I want my data to be sufficiently, like, have sufficient coverage so that for any state action pair that a, poli a candidate policy want to visit with high density, I also provide like a, a large enough density for that state action pair. Yes. Are there any examples where this condition holds? Yes, I'll be talking about that exactly, like in, in three slides. Is this like a linear copy, divergence? Sorry. Yeah. So this is a kind of uh, yes, exactly that. I, I don't know how to pronounce. I, I forgot the name, but yes, I think you're right. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Good. You need this condition to hold for all other policies by or only the optimal? Policies? No, you need it for a large class of policies. For, yes. And we'll see an example uh, for. Okay. So it turns out that so what we show in the paper is that, so basically this, assum this assumption you know that it's necessary. Uh, because if you remove this assumption, or in other words, if C is unbounded or you don't, you, you just, you, there exists an exponential lower bound. But it's actually the, 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 the nature of this lower bound is pretty subtle, which I'll explain uh, shortly. Um, okay, so, um, so, so first of all, there's a trivial failure mode when you don't assume a, a upper bound on the C parameter, right? So let's say my data looks like something like a spike over here. I only give you data for a single state action pair. And data is missing everywhere else. Okay, of course you can't learn because the data is not sufficiently exploratory, right? So, um, so that's an uninteresting failure mode, which we want to uh, remove uh, or exclude in the first place. So the more interesting question to ask here is, uh, what if we just choose the data distribution like favorably, right? So someone give us a sufficiently exploratory data, like the most exploratory data ever, if that's the case, can we just remove this assumption altogether? Okay, so the interesting thing that we see here is that the answer is actually no. Okay? So the reason that the answer is no is because this assumption is not only an assumption about data, which actually takes me a long time to realize is that this assumption is both an assumption on the data and also on the MDP dynamics. And here is why, right? So this assumption talks about the talks about the relationship between two, these two distributions. And this distribution, or this, there are actually many such distributions for this red curve that are induced by different policies, and that's induced by the MDP dynamics. So the assumption that C is finite or C is small is actually saying a lot of things about the underlying dynamics of the MDP. And in particular, if the MDP dynamics are unregulated, it can be the case that even if you choose the most favorable, favorable distribution, no sample efficient learning can exist. And just to give you a sense, I'll quickly go over this. So here is the proof sketch. So basically what you do is that you construct an exponential tree and such that one of the leaves are more rewarding than all the other leaves. Okay, so basically this is like a multi-arm bandit with exponentially many arms. So without further assumptions, you can't get away. Uh, you must suffer like exponential in horizon uh, sample complexity. And what you can do is that you can construct the realizable f uh, that is small, such that the logarithmic size of this f doesn't explain away the hardness of learning. And we will be talking about like stronger assumptions on the function class, but it turns out that it's still like very easy to satis to satisfy all those assumptions in this like. Exponential tree example. Yes. And if, you, and if exponential in H is okay? Well, exponential in H is not okay here, right? So we want like. If it would. Yeah. You can do it. Yes. Well, if you if it's if if you have exponential in H, you can just try each. 
You can just literally run it as a multi-arm bandit with exponential. No, in this example, but in general, you 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 give okay, a lower bound on one example. I could, I, I think I didn't do uh, But is it true that you can always find something which is an exponential range? What do you mean by always? For any MDP. For any MDP, yeah. the and if it's finite horizon, you can really run a, multi a contextual bandit algorithm with the but start you have state. many start states. You so, that, so that's the context. What? That's the, that's the context that the learner sees. But in this, uh, right, but like, he doesn't have information. And this is you like never saw this state settings. before. What would you do? You need to choose a policy. Yeah. Oh, so you're saying that if, if you give me exponential sample complexity, how can I? Yeah. Is there an upper bound? So, so here is the upper bound. If H is 5. Is it easy? Uh, if, the, if the horizon or the number of actions? Horizon. Horizon is five. Okay, so, th so the, here, here is the upper bound. Okay, so what you do is that you take actions uniformly at random at each time step, and you collect a lot of data, and you use the data to do important sampling over trajectories to evaluate each policy. But you're in an off policy setting. You, got this, you have a, a huge sample that you got, and you're not allowed to sample. You need Right. So, so, but, but, but in that case, I would, I would ask for like uniformly random sound. I mean, no. So they're, 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 So I guess the, I guess the. I thought you don't understand. I'm worried that I don't understand the model, not the answer. So I think in that case. So I can take this offline, but but I think it's it's uh, it would like that algorithm would work, or so, yeah, it needs slightly different protocol, but since that it should work over here. Okay, so so basically, if you constructed this example, you realize that this function approximator basically doesn't help you at all. So the hardness of learning still exists, and in particular, you realize that this hardness is against any algorithm that can actually have interactive access with the environment. But we are interested in the batch learning setting. And the final step of the proof uh, is uh, the observation that in this problem, the only thing that is unknown is the, end, uh, is the terminal uh, reward. And the dynamics are purely deterministic and known. Okay. So in this family of problems, any any batch algorithm combined with any data distribution can be emulated by an, uh, by an agent or learner that, interacted, that uh, actively interact with the environment. Because if you want to sample a, uh, sample a transition from any state, it can just play that action sequence to get to that state and generate the sample. So the, the hardness of learning transfer to the, to the batch learning setting, okay, so which means that they're just doesn't exist a exploratory distribution. None of the learning distribution would work in this example, which really motivates or, or really necessitates the, that uh, we need to consider MDPs with more kind of like smooth dynamics. So, so this is really like assumption on both the data and the MDP dynamics. And uh, someone just asked that uh, what are examples where this assumption will hold, right? So here is one canonical example. Uh, and I think like Mondi will probably talk about a very similar model in her talk. So you, you can consider like a large MDPs where the transition matrix. So basically you put this transition probabilities into an SA by S big matrix. And if this matrix has a low rank, there will always exist a um, exploratory distribution. And in fact, it, that kind of exploratory distribution can be generated by a, uh, like, a, like a mixture of actual distributions that you can induce uh, by taking some of the policies. Okay, so this is like, if you want any like concrete example of like where this assumption holds, like a, a low rank MDP would be a can canonical example. Okay, and another interesting thing is that including a, uh, low rank MDPs and a few other examples, so these kind of like structures are also structures that enable efficient exploration algorithms with value function approximation, which we actually discover, uh, so, uh, discovered in a uh, paper in ISML uh, 17. Uh, actually, Alec talked about this paper a couple of years ago here at the Simons. Uh, so uh, this interesting connection allows us to kind of like compare the batch learning setting and exploration setting side by side 
and we'll talk about some of the interesting implications later. Can I still ask my question? Are there any examples? When would you have this to have, have exactly low rank? It sounds like a very, very strong assumption. So uh, if you want, so, OK, so I guess this is mathematically like concrete example. But I guess you're maybe asking for more like practical. So uh, I guess I'll give one example is like exa one example that we often give is uh, these kind of like a visual grid world that you're finding uh, RL benchmarks where the dynamics are defined over a small latent state space. Let's say you're just doing a navigation task in a, like a, a grid world, but w you don't observe which grid you're in. And instead, like, let's say the entire thing is rendered in some game engine, and you observe like raw pixel images. Uh, that gives you like first person view of the environment. Right. So uh, that kind of environment will have like these kind of like low rank structure because the rank will be determined by the number of grids, not by the like the pixel images. And the other uh, thing you can imagine is something like a dialogue systems, where so these like low rank hidden vectors are can be things like the intention of the users. And, yeah. uh, I didn't understand. What does the low rank assumption buy you? It ensures that. So it basically ensures. So the low rank assumption basically what happens is that when you do the transition, yeah. you start from S A A transition to S prime. You go through like a bottleneck, okay. right? And like it's the hidden factor. And condition on the hidden factor, the next state distribution is like like independent of like all the previous things. And okay. basically, what happens in these kind of environments is that for any distribution that can be naturally generated over the entire state action space, you can always factorize that. Okay. You can always express those distributions as the distribution over the hidden factors, yeah. and then that kind of like uncontrolled emission process. Okay. So that when you compute these densities, this it's essentially the density is over those hidden factors, not over the more. It yeah, doesn't so depend so on C the. C is like the number of hidden factors. Yes, exactly. Like, or you can upper bound that C by the number of hidden factors or the rank here. I guess I need to run faster because this is kind of like a more like a known <laughs> the, uh, the, the assumption that we understand relatively well. I, I do want to uh, get to the more interesting assumption that uh, we still don't quite understand. Okay, so if you, if, you, if you agree with me that we said, okay, okay, at least like we need some of these kind of assumptions on the data and on the environment. And in other words, we're happy to pay this polynomial dependence on the C parameter here. Okay. So now we ask the question again, can we get this sample complexity with realizability alone, or we need much stronger assumption? Okay, so that's the really like the open question that I've been attacking like on and off for a long time, and we still don't know. And it's actually a very, inter a very interesting question. Okay, so um, what I will do next is that I'll, I'll, I'll get into a concrete algorithm and help you understand a little bit why realizability alone is may not be enough, right? So if you think about this assumption from like a standard learning theory perspective, like realizability is this crazy like strong assumption that no one wants to make. And like it turns out that when you get to the RL land, this is the weakest possible assumption that um, you can end up with and it's likely insufficient. Okay, so the particular algorithm that I'll be considering is fitted iteration, uh, just to uh, refresh for uh, people who are familiar with FQI. You don't actually need to like, understand this algorithm, but just for people who know this algorithm. So basically what you do is that you, you, you try to use your function class to approximate the uh, value iteration procedure. You initialize your function f arbitrarily, and every iteration, you convert your RL data set into a least square regression data set, where, you set, where the input is the state action pair, and the output depends on the function of the previous iteration. We call this part the empirical Bellman update based on the single data point. And you do ERM over this, uh, over this data set uh, using your function class. And that's the, the argument is the next iteration of the function, and you repeat this. Okay. So basically, this is the one line description of uh, this entire algorithm. Again, you don't need to understand this because the next example I will show is like much simpler than all of this. Okay, so, so let's. So what I would describe to you now is how realizability, <coughs> if you only assume realizability, how can this simple algorithm just completely go wrong in the worst case? OK. And before I tell you how it goes wrong, let me first tell you uh, briefly like how it works. It's actually very simple. So, so this is like a, a simple example. You have a chain MDP. 
uh, there are like just 10 states. You start from state one and there, there's no action, there's, or there's only one action that moves you forward, 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 and at the end you get a Bernoulli reward, that's it. Okay? And uh, so basically like for now, our data set, because there's only one action, I'm gonna omit the action in the data set. So your data set will look like something like, I start from state number one, I get a zero reward and transition to state number two, and so on and so forth. And at the end, I, uh, I get a random reward is either one or zero, and the process terminates. Okay. And basically, if you run something like FQI or anything TD like on this process, on this problem, it looks like the following, right? So you start from the very end, and you get data that looks start from number ten and gives you a random reward. You average the rewards, you get an estimate of the value uh, of state number 10. Let's say it's something like 5.1, 0 0.501. Okay, and you could, then you go to the previous time step, you get data that looks like nine, zero reward, transition to state number 10. You convert that into the regression data set that says state number nine probably has a value of zero point, the value that you just learned for state number 10. Okay, and you do the regression over that, and you learn that state number nine probably has this value as well, and so on and so forth. And eventually you learn that, okay, state number one probably has a value of 0 0.501, okay? So this is how like, this algorithm works in this simple example, and in fact, almost all dynamic programming-based algorithms that learn from bootstrapped uh, targets will, re will uh, degrade to exactly the same behavior on this simple example. So we're actually considering a large family of uh, methods here. Okay, so, so this is working all fine. So how can things go wrong? Okay, so this is working all fine because this is not actually the function approximation setting. In this example, we're allowed to make any predictions. We're, a, we're able to predict any number for the value of any state. So to mimic the difficulty of function approximation, in the next example, I'm gonna restrict the possible values that the learner can predict for every single state, although I only have a small number of states. Okay, so in particular, for state number 10, I'm, I'm gonna say the learner can only predict from these two values, and for number nine, these two values, and so on and so forth. Okay, now let's run the algorithm again and see what happens. Okay, so for state number 10, things are the same, so I can predict 5.01, so everything is fine, so I'm good. Okay, now in, in this transition, I get the data, the regression data set I get is like state number nine probably has a value of 0.501, but I can only report from 0.5, either 0.5 or 0.502. And they are equally distant to my label. So by adversarial uh, tie breaking, I could possibly just choose like 5.02. Sorry, 0 0.5. And similarly, if you, if you realize that basically I'm constructing this example with the function class so that this gap between these two values are growing exponentially over time. And every time just by tie breaking, you can choose the wrong answer, which doubles the error that you incur in the previous time step. And eventually you get a ridiculously large prediction at the initial state. In other words, if you run this algorithm and you want to get a reasonable absolute approximation at the initial state, you need to see this reward exponentially many often. And furthermore, although this function class is constructed in an adversarial manner, you do, we do satisfy realizability because 0.5 is the right answer. And this example is actually given uh, with Chris Dan in one of our papers in 2018, and actually like results of similar nature has existed for a like, long time, right? So if you look at like, some of the early work by Ben Roy, like John Sisiklis, there, there are a lot of like, divergence examples of uh, dynamic, approximate dynamic programming. Um, but I think this, this, this example is kind of like a, a more intuitive and more plain. Yeah. I'm wondering, so a lot of the goal of uh, reinforcement learning is actually finding the right policy. Yeah. But this kind of example is really saying you kind of... Yeah, so, so basically, it, it, yeah, good, good question. But, but the thing is that you can easily extend this kind of example to a policy finding, right? So you can add another initial state, uh, add a new initial state over here where you can choose between two paths. And if you have the wrong, like a largely wrong prediction of the, the value of this path, it can 
you can easily translate that translate that to a policy loss. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a, I mean, this is a very stylized yes. uh, function function approximator. So typically, uh, you know, what I'm able to what values I'm able to assign to state one are tightly tied to what values that I that I, I will tie if I have a linear approximator, a deep network, uh, what have you, right? And you've always got this tension, this this uh, trade off. Right, so right. yeah, I'd like to push state one down to to, to you know one point zero one two, but that's going to screw up my estimate at state ten, for example. Typically, here these are completely decorrelated. They are, they are. But well, actually, I, I, so not sure this answers, but so I mean, at least theoretically, you need to. Examples. I mean, we, yes. We, we, like we, yeah. we have this NIPS paper on uh, what we're calling delusion. Delusion, right? yes, right. missing that. It, that kind of thing. Yeah. But I'm just trying to get a sense of. For more realistic classes of approximators that people use in practice, right. can you kind of construct this the similar? So thing? that's unclear. We only have this slide as the example, okay. and I think in literature we have these very small examples. We don't have an example in the uh, more realistic. Okay. But anyway, so basically, uh, uh, I'll skip this. But basically, what happens is that you can fix this when you introduce much stronger assumptions on the function class. In particular, you can say, you know, like if my function class is closed under Bellman update. And in this example, it means that for whatever predictions I'm allowed to make for one level, I need to be able to make the same predictions at the previous level. And if this happens, I'll be able to control error, and error won't blow up when you do approximate dynamic programming. But this assumption seems like very strong because it's a closeness assumption, so it can be violated even more severely when you get a richer function approximator. Right, so that's pretty bad. Um, so, so basically, it turns out that we have, uh, so just to I think I'm running out of time, just like quickly go through the rest of the talk. So we have uh, reasonable strong uh, like evidence to show that realizability is not enough. So what I really want is to prove a information theoretic lower bound that says that if I only have realizability, this is not enough. Okay. But it turns out that this bound is like surprisingly hard to prove. And I'll give you like a quick sense of like uh, how proof attempts can fail. So the first attempt fails. Like just as how you prove like lower bound in information theory, what you usually do is that you construct an exponentially large family of hard instances and try to somehow like induce hardness from there. And I can tell you that in this example, if that's all you do, you already failed. You don't even need to tell me what your construction is. And the reason is because the following. In the batch learning setting, model-based RL can succeed on the realizability alone. Okay, so if all, if all you construct is a family of hard instances, and you do not impose any further restrictions, you can't prevent an information theoretic learner to be model-based. And, and more concretely, you can actually construct a slightly bigger F prime from the model class that satisfy those strong representation conditions. Okay, so, and we do have some uh, idea of like how to impose the restriction, restriction that the learner has to be value-based. In particular, one thing you can do is to say, the learner does not observe the state directly, but instead it can only access the state through the eva evaluation of candidate value functions. And it's actually a very interesting uh, mechanism that we have used before to show a separation gap between value-based and model-based RL in the exploration setting. Uh, and there has been some like, related results, but it turns out that in this particular setting, if this is the only mechanism, it still doesn't work. Okay, and I have a, like, a laundry list of like like a lot of requirements that you need to satisfy to get a viable kind of like construction. And I, it's not that I have a construction and I don't know how to prove the lower bound. I don't even have a construction that satisfies like all this list. This is pretty interesting. Okay, so I'm getting into it. This is the only two slides left. So why do I care about this? Okay, so I want to talk about a little bit about the high level implications. So really, um, this, this lower bound, the result, the statement of this lower bound is particularly interesting. If you look at the larger picture that compares bash RL versus online exploration of RL, and also value-based and model-based RL. Right. So, like, in, so we know that we need to assume like, smooth dynamics. And for bash learning, we need to assume exploratory data. So that part is kind of like comparable. And now if you look at the representation condition, so there's a very, if this hardness conjecture is true, we'll get a very interesting gap between, for example, bash RL and online RL, because we've previously shown that 
if you have smooth dynamics, when you do online exploration with value function approximation, you only need realizability. Okay? And if realizability alone is not enough for batch learning, it tells you that with value function approximation, being able to actively interact with the environment and experiment with the environment gives you a lot of power that mitigate this harness related to the representation. And similarly, there can be like a gap between value-based RL and model-based RL if the harness conjecture is true, as well as Okay, so this is why the, 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 the conjecture itself is important. On the other hand, I yeah. So you're saying that online setting, if I remember correctly, the realizable is, uh, is okay if you, you need to assume ba low bell rank. Right, but remember. low bell rank, so maybe miss that. The, uh, I will be happy to talk about offline, but low bell rank is somewhat like, comparable to this like smoothness of dynamics over here. So those two are comparable to each other. And for example, like when you have low rank MDPs, both these and this assumption holds. I see. Yeah. And uh, this is the last slide, I promise. Uh, so the other thing that is interesting is that not only the conjecture itself is interesting, but if the conjecture can be proved, the construction will be also highly interesting for the following reason. So all the lower bound construction we have currently having literature of RL, all of them basically actually exhibit a banded structure. Right? So this is what we, how we prove a lower bound for like tabular uh, MDPs. And this is what we prove uh, for these like uh, large MDPs. So this is just a multi-arm bandit, one step. This is a multi-arm bandit like with exponentially many arms. That's it. Actually, none of those constructions reflect the interesting and challenging setting of RL, where you have multi-step decision making, and the intermediate feedback signals are informative. Like here, you get like uninformative like intermediate feedbacks. But really, RL is interesting when you get in informative intermediate feedbacks. And also the problem has to be seriously stochastic. And it turns out that uh, there are other open problems in RL that are also craving for these kind of interesting counterexamples. For example, Attica and I had an uh, open problem in code that discussed uh, why there, there seems to be missing a right horizon dependence in tabular PAC MD, MDP uh, literature. And also, uh, so Monty will probably also talk about this. So if you have linear value function approximation and you do exploration, we don't know if, if you can get efficient learning if you only assume like linear function approximation and don't assume any, anything else. And I think if the, if the counterexample exists, it will be highly similar to whatever we use to prove this construction. And uh, with this, I want to conclude my talk and I hope to resolve these open problems in the future and hope you will join me. Thanks. Okay, so we have time maybe for one quick question while the next speaker prepares. If the MDP is deterministic, yeah. is there an upper bound for your Yeah, yeah, so uh, that's the part I skipped. So when you do value function approximation, if the MDP de uh, is deterministic, there's a very simple algorithm you can do that you can succeed on the realizability alone. Okay. So basically what you do, so basically the difficulty, so what you do is that you can literally just estimate the Bellman error uh, like directly. Okay. And with stochastic dynamics, you cannot do that because if you remember in Bellman equation, the expectation is a conditional expectation. Is that conditional on a single state action pair is the annoying thing that you can't get over. But if the, if the thing is deterministic, that conditional expectation goes away. So what do you do after you estimate the Bellman error? You minimize it. Yeah. So you, you just do like, it's a straightforward like a Bellman error minimization and just, it works both theoretically and empirically. Okay, let's thank the speaker again. Thank <laughs> you.